Hello, everyone. It was my honor and pleasure to provide an IEEE Study Stay Circuit Society talk at Georgia Tech earlier this year. Since some people might not be able to come to my talk before, I'd like to share this talk with you now. Let's discuss why the study's design changes from impairments. To make the presentation clear, I will provide the introduction and background. During the impairment's journey, I will describe the signaling and timing back and forth with the surface topology. Lastly, make a conclusion for today's surface talk. Every time I watch my kids playing with the Lego and feel like we are doing the same thing, for example, putting something together creatively and resulting the right picture. But the outcome could be totally different, even though having the same pieces on the left. So you could have lots of flexibility to decide on the surface topology with lots of black pieces. Again, it's going to be fun in today's lecture since we will play a similar Lego game to put everything together. Let's go through the introduction and background with a few industrial trends before starting the technical discussion. For the studies related trends in the semiconductor acts, the US Congress has signed $52 billion for the semiconductor last year. Also, the IDC has announced the amount of our data usage will reach 175 zettabytes in 2025, which is very impressive. Let's see why we would need so much data usage in the world. Even though we are talking about the wireline transmission, the 5G wireless trend will still depend on the service. If you recognize lots of functionality inside your smartphone, that should be obvious. They will transfer lots of data to the baseband unit. Therefore, the service is a must. In addition, lots of digital signal processing would need a service for the data exchange as well. Since the amount of data is increased, we may need a higher data rate in every standard protocol. In CP, the data rate requires 56 gigabit per second from 12 gigabit per second in the past. In JESD204 and PCIe, people already push the data rate up to 32 gigabit per second now. That's for the 5G. How about our wireline systems? The most obvious wireline system is Ethernet, owing to the high demand in the data center driven by the cloud computing over AI. The speed requirement would reach 1.6 terabit Ethernet. Another interesting picture of the data center room comparison is very messy in 2009 must be clean and well organized nowadays owing to the ceiling or cities. We will dive into that after a few slides. Another very important interface in a computer system is the FIFA Flow Component Interconnect Express. It's an interface standard for connecting high-speed input-output components every high-performance computing motherboard has several PCIe slots you can use to add GPU, RAID class, Wi-Fi class, or solid-state drive add-on class for data communication. Back in the old days in 1995, the PCIe bandwidth was only 33 megabit per second times 4 over 8. Today's PCA5 
would have bandwidth up to 32 gigabit per second times 16, which is 2,000 more than throughput now. Another recent popular application of data transmission is automotive industry, driven by the demand of the safety assistance over self-driving. Lots of data must be exchanged and processed. Therefore, the speed requirements are increased to 10 gigabit per second in automotive Ethernet, 13 gigabit per second in ASA, and 48 gigabit per second in MIPI. Besides imaging application, what's the RS new service application? Right, as you've known, the data requirements are increased, as are the number of functionality. Therefore, the chip size of the SOC will become bigger and bigger, which will be a challenge for manufacturing to mitigate the manufacturing EO issue. People think about the system in package SIP instead of the system on chip SOC. Therefore, the monotetic wires are replaced by cross package die to die interconnect and the service die-to-die -die interface is a must. In addition to the EO, another benefit of the SIP is that we could leverage the IP from multiple vendors instead of a single vendor easily. Why is that? Can you think about the idea behind it? Correct. Time to market. The second proof of IP might not be available in 4 nanometer as the CPU or GPU, which is okay, since we still can use our second proof of IP in an older process node. What's the other benefit of doing that? Yes, not only the cost is lower, but also the performance is better. For example, the angle portion may not benefit from the most advanced technology, like the digital circuit. Then, we can use 16 nanometer service I.O. to get the best performance and low cost. Last point, since the die-to-die service is for the chip integration, do you see any constraint with it? Correct, the die-to-die service must be high speed, low power, and small area, so very challenging in the PPA. Any questions so far? Good. If we know the die-to-die -die service would help the IP business, we'll look at how the interface IP train is. From this trend in the past, we've known the need of service IP keep growing and would be almost 2.5 billion markets by 2025. This is an example wireless data communication and the goal is simply to move the digital data from one side to the other through any medium, which be a cable or any PCB trace, to drive a piece of a wire on the transmitter side. A buffer is needed and the receiver side may have another low noise driver to recover the signal levels to a digital level. Is anything wrong with the wireline ceiling if the speed is going to be higher and higher? For example, can we have the data throughput up to 32 gigabit per second in the digital call from DIN transfer to the DL? Specifically, can digital large run so fast at a 30 picosecond bit period? Especially, you might have some idea from the physical design automation class that the complicated digital gates are present now automatically. Therefore, it's impossible to meet the digital timing. What can we do? Correct. If a digital call can run at 1 gigabit per second, 
we could just send the data in 32 pair passes. So the digital call will meet the digital timing reasonably. But there are 32 I.O. pins on each side and 32 channels and difficult design in the routings of on-chip, package, and PCB. Lots of messy cables in the whole data center here. So any idea of reducing the number of I.O. pins? Correct. Sizer and Desizer, which is the service. We prefer only one I.O. pin on each side and one channel. So the area of the chip, package, and PCB can be reduced and lead to a very low cost owing to the dense implementation. The low area means a low I.O. capacitance and would provide a low power solution naturally to keep the C-Link operating at a high speed. The digital call must be retimed by the CISER to perform pair in CL out to a decisor to reverse C in pair out. Therefore, we'll discuss the timing in the service later. For the big one of the service, we need to know what the goal of the service is. Can you guess from the green circle and or anything you learn from the digital computation? For those bits, what would you like to achieve? Yes, simply receiving the same bits as what has been said. For example, 10111011 was sent. So you should receive 10111011 here. Or to be straightforward, no error or very low bit array during digital communication is the goal. But the bit array could be too difficult to evaluate from lots of impairments, and we must try to evaluate the transmission performance by other methodologies. Firstly, let's look at how the digital decision was made. From this decision example, the analog input will go to a slicer or sampler based on the decision level. Decision maker will convert the VS sample voltage level to the digital output bit one if VS is above the decision level. So we care about the sample sampling time, TS and sample voltage level, VS. Six both would affect the quantizer's decision to be wrong or right, and then affect the bit array target. In addition, we not only care about the sample bit one, in the green one, but also every bit, like the blue bit zero, we are interested in. Therefore, every bit of time sample is very critical for getting the long timing or small sample voltage. What's the easy way of checking raw samples sequentially? Why? Chop the waveform in each bit time over one unit interval and overlap them show in one UI over two UI. As you can see, the I diagram become a very useful tool for evaluating the timing or signaling performance or margin. For example, you can identify whether the CK data sample one or the CK data sample two is better to get the right decision over every. Also, you can identify either the sample version one VS one or the sample version two VS two has a better voltage margin for low bit array target. Overall, the performance metric can be summarized by the I width and I height easily. But the change could be the reciprocal. 
what is the channel impairments from what you learn in the advanced digital communication class? Any guesses? Let's go through them one by one. From this simplified single I.O. pin, can you tell any impairments here? Yes, interface for single-ended signaling. For example, the single ended is less immune to any common mode noise interference. In addition, the simultaneous switching output SSO noise or crosstalk could be huge. Ideally, the single ended signaling is half the pin, wiring, hum, and power. But the design overhead to deal with the interface may put the power back to a little. Also, we may need more wires to increase the isolation. The wire number goes up and might not be half of the differential ended anymore. Again, these are the certain impairments you must know. And make a trade-off on which way you like to go. Question? Could you guess if there are any other impairments around the red circle interface? Please recall any microwave classes you've learned. Right, impedance matching or reflection. The incident signal will reflect partially if the impedance does not match. Therefore, the part of the power transferred to the low versus the receiver load will have a peak power transferring, which means there's no reflection under the low matching condition. On the other hand, with the impedance mismatch, the receiver signal power is less, and that would degrade the SNR due to the distorted signal power. What can we do to reduce the reflection? Right, adding the resistive termination would achieve the impedance match and reduce the reflection. Also, most standards will specify the return loss specification. For example, the return loss must be less than minus ADB at 100 MHz. Therefore, the resistor mismatch may have a great amount of tolerance. Just give you an idea with a 100 ohm differential impedance. The termination impedance could be 50 ohm up to 200 ohm without violating the specification at DC. But what caused the impairments at high frequencies? Do you want to guess from your analog class system? Correct. Big I.O. capacitance causes the high frequency return loss issue. The impedance of the capacitance over frequency is 1 divided by SC. Therefore, the case study with the cap at the I.O. shows the return loss at 10 gigahertz violates the mass ADB specification if the capacitance is larger than 400 femtofarad. What can we do? Sure, we must reduce the capacitance at the I.O., but reducing C pair isn't always easy, since ESD always be required to meet the 1 kV or 2 kV HBM, which may cause a big cap at the I.O. In addition, the bonding pad or bump is needed for the package and the circuit like the driver itself is big. The added capacitance must be mitigated with the coils to shift the total impedance higher to a higher frequency. Without coil, case study here may show you the return loss will be improved from 650 femtofarad to 450 femtofarad, but still not meet the specification. Adding the coil with the 450 femtofarad 
the return loss can meet minus 8 dB at 10 GHz and minus 6 dB up to 12 GHz. Another useful one is to add one more LC data to make it broadband matching, which is similar to multiple cascaded LC transmission line model. The added coil was called T coil because of its shape. Let's look at the channel loss impairment. Is the loss really an issue? If you think it's yes, how about only resistive loss? For example, a resistive divider. Your understanding is correct. The sweet impairments can be amplified by the RX preamp, so it could be minor. As you can see, both bit sequence and I are still good after 15 dB resistive loss and the swing is still greater than 150 mV peak to peak differential, which is good enough for most RX. From your low C transmission line learned from the microwave class, you should know the resistive one is not real channel. First of all, the PCB characteristic at the low frequencies less than 10 MHz it can be a RAM model with a very little resistance. But big capacitance like 100 picofarad per meter, other channels had a similar capacity as well, around the similar order. Secondly, the PCB characteristic at high frequencies greater 100 MHz would be a distributed model instead of a constant characteristic impedance zina 100 ohm in differential but has a frequency dependent loss due to the skin effect the current will be crowded at the surface at high frequencies and cause higher loss in addition the dielectric loss will be higher if there is a higher frequency this loss is mainly due to the back and forth rotation of electric dipoles due to the changing electric fields. So, the plot of a loss versus frequency shows zero dB loss at 10 MHz, but up to 31 dB loss at 5 GHz. Any issue with that? Correct. Intersymbol interference, I say. The ceiling may require a long reach or low cost channel and the channel's bandwidth trends to be much lower compared to the next ray. Again, under low pass frequency response of the channel, the time domain pass response is spread out over very slow transition time. Before the channel, the pass shape is fast within a bit, but after the channel, each bit or symbol may overlap interference with their previous or the next few symbols with such long tail rise for transition, which is so called inter symbol interference. The bit stream also show you there were two bits zeros were mistaken to be two bits ones at the receiver. So, we need to equalize the 30 dB loss at the next ray to make the overall frequency response flat and lower the BL ray. The frequency response of the channel shows the loss is higher as the frequency are higher. Can we add something to make the response flat even before or after the channel is fine? Any idea from the filter knowledge you learned from the another class? Right. The equation's frequency response must be the inverse of the channel, such that the total frequency response of the channel and equalizer will be flat over the frequencies. 
So due to the low pass filter of the channel, we need to add a high pass response as an equalizer. Please be advised, this is just an example without considering the circuit impairments or constrain realistically. Instead, the mathematical example would like to provide you with an intuitive thinking of equation, which equals the 0 dB in magnitude at all frequencies here. After knowing the high pass response equalizer is needed, how do we get a high pass response? From the Ergot or DSP class, you may know how to design the high pass filter with the passive filter and active filter of an analog filter or FIR and IIR of a digital filter. So I will leave other filters for your exercise, but only talk about the FIR filter now. First, where should we put the FIR high pass filter? Any idea from the digital point of view? Bingo! All the delay will be easy with the flip up. Just one clock cycle, right? Good. So you might want to put the HEQ1 before the channel, which is the transmitter TX. In the frequency domain of the FFE with the proper tap coefficient, the FFE's high pass filter can compensate for the channel's low pass filter and made the overall response maximum flood response in green. After understanding the preference of the FFV and the TX, let's go over how the TX FV is realized. The three tap FIR shows a digital delay with the fifth up and each delay HN, HN of 1, HN of 2 will drive the energy circuit with the corresponding strength, which is the coefficient C0, C1, C2 here. In addition, the coefficient could not only a positive but also a negative value. The sign of a coefficient can be done easy by applying the inversion of the input signal to achieve the negative sign. Furthermore, the TXFV can also cancel both the precursor and post-cursor RSI with a high programmability. The blue curve shows the one pre and one post tab were applied to realize the high pass filtering. In another time domain case, the PRBS 7 I diagram would be a good center check for the equation performance. As you can see, the cross eye after the 15 dB loss channel without the FFV can be wide open after applying both first precursor and post cursor about roughly 10 dB the emphasis level before the channel. After spending lots of effort to mitigate the channel's impairments, even though the link interface is perfect now, do you see any circuit impairments from the algorithm or random process class? Correct. Noise. The added circuit would add the noise on the signal you send. Therefore, on the receiver side, you could still pick up lots of noise and get a wrong sample decision due to the recording noise at the sample time. Here shows the 0, 1, 0 would be mistaken to be 0, 0, 0 due to the middle sample being below the threshold level and determined to be 0 mistakenly. From the ergo class, We've known the noise exists in a circuit inside the passive resistor or active transistor or any PN junction. 
for the random noise in a CMOS process. The thermal noise may be from the resistor and MOSFET, and the flicker noise is from the MOSFET. Lastly, the short noise occurs at any PN junction. Again, from the random signal class, those noise are unbounded, which means the statistic characteristic should be evaluated to get the peak noise from the mean and the standard deviation values. The larger peak noise amplitude occurs at a longer waiting time over larger amount of samples in the outlier distribution. Therefore, the sigma value is related to the bit array requirement. Again, the bit array is the total error divided by the total number of samples. So, the lower bit array requires a greater number of samples over a longer waiting time. For example, for bit array equals 1 e minus 12, the plus minus 7 sigma peak noise amplitude should be taken with the mean Gaussian noise in a lean budget estimation. Similarly, the bit array equals 1 e minus 15 should taken plus minus a sigma peak noise amplitude. Questions? If no question, let's go through the timing impairments. Again, addition to the signaling, we've known the timing is also very critical to make the right decision or a sample for the data recovery. As you can see, the TS clock must have the proper timing to serialize the data without error and provide low jitter data through the low jitter TXPL. On the receiving side, the ice clock must get to the right or good sampling phase to get or recover the data correctly. Therefore, the clock data recovery CDR is a must to extract the proper sampling phase information. If the CDR is designed properly, it can track the TX input phase within its tracking bandwidth nicely, such that it's safe online its middle of the input eye as shown here. Let's review the service clock information by following the one to six steps through the 10 gigabit per second case study. First, at the TXI, the reference clock is 100 MHz for the PCIe and 156.25 MHz for 10 gigabit Ethernet, and RS could be other frequencies. Then, the TXPO would lock to the reference clock and provide frequency multiplication up to 5 GHz for 10 gigabit per second hardware usage. The 5 GHz and its divided clock steer the 40 bits parallel data to 10 gigabit per second serial data, which is sent to the RX through the channel. The RX CDR may start with a frequency at 5 GHz, but with a certain frequency and phase offset since the CDR will look for the input data transition, or edge, sample to move the phase back and forth. The proper sampling phase of the CDR's 5 GHz and its divided clock distributes 10 gigabit per second serial data to the 40 bits pair data. Lastly, the TX and X 40 pair clocks are very critical information between the interface of the PMA and digital core. Therefore, the timing liberty information is a must for the integration between the service and digital core. After knowing where the TXPO is a must, what are the requirements of the PL? Yes, the most obvious requirement 
is the frequency stability. In other words, the frequency must be fixed without moving. The constant frequency during the operation will make all systems predictable and reliable. What else could be the concern? Yes, noise. The circuit may have the noise inevitably, and those fast noise or jitter will still break the system operation. But how? That's back to a simple timing case study as a quiz. Can you identify whether the CK data sample 1 or the CK data sample 2 has a better timing margin to get the right decision or L3? Any guesses? Bingo! CK1 is not a good choice to differential large one or zero easy, not to mention the L3. So the CK2 would be your best choice to identify the large one or large zero with a very low BL rate than the CK1 data sample. But how do we achieve that from your feedback class knowledge? Correct. For the CDR's phase alignment by the edge sample, the clock recovery circuit must include a phase detector, PD of the phase comparison, rule filter for decision filter, and VCO for the clock generation. Since the clock is free running, the feedback line to the phase detector is necessary to cross the loop and correct the clock phase to the right spot. In this situation, the edge sample of the data and clock are the inputs of the PD who provide the edge difference information to help the feedback loop and the clock align with the input data. Here is a simplified tracking example of the clock phase recovery. Case A shows that the clock phase is late and the PD output VL is then filtered to VF to drive the VCO faster to case B. But the big phase lag in case A will then drive the VCO too fast and then the CK phase is started earlier in case B this time. So the PD output VE is then filtered to VT to finally drive the VCO into tri-state and stay phase aligned at case C, ideally. Again, during the phase aligned process, you only care about the transition or edge information of both data and clock. From the previous case study, you may notice the response is a low pass response for CDS phase tracking. The phase error between the RX input and simply clock is half UI with maximum timing margin, even though there is a TXPO low frequency jitter, much less than the CDR bandwidth. So the B array will not be impacted by the TX jitter here. But the high frequencies, F2, sinusoidal jitter at the TX output over RX input cannot track by the CDR. So the TX jitter hurts the B array. The phase error between the RX input and sampling clock is much less than half UI if the TX high frequency jitter is added. Let's go through both the signaling and timing here. Since the circuit may consist of unbounded random noise or jitter, statistic analysis is necessary for different BLA targets. For example, we can sweep the sampling phase in time and evaluate the BLA to produce the best top curve of the BLA versus time. 
Similarly, we can sweep the threshold voltage vertically and evaluate the bit array to produce the beta curve of the bit array versus voltage swing. Lastly, once we have the beta curve, we can determine the timing and voltage margin easily for the rest of impairments. For example, with the bit array equals ye minus fitting, that would be obvious the timing margin is 0.15 ui and the voltage margin is 50 mV peak to peak differential. If combine both the beta curve, curve the bit array eye control can be produced as well. Let's conclude today's talk with a few summaries here. First, the big data throughput creates high demand for SERDIS. But SERDIS is a big system, including channel, interface, and circuitry. For example, any impairments would degrade the bit array performance and removing or reducing impairments is a must for low bit array goal. In addition, the improvement ideas come from the best understanding of the service impairments and the fundamentals. For all of you, even though there is no service class in Georgia Tech, there are still lots of related fundamental classes you can learn. Thanks for your attention. Hope you can enjoy your own service topology by playing Lego here. Lots of creative architecture and circuit images inside would help improve or change the world. Remember, your little contribution would be visible in every device in the world.